His heart was broken, mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. The nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, His life for mine. How could it ever be that He would die, God's Son would die, to save a wretch like me? One love divine, he gave his life for mine. His scars of suffering brought me healing. He spilled his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrow gave me joy untold. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die to save? like me one love divine he gave his life for mine he was despised and rejected stripped of his garments and oppressed i am loved and accepted and i wear a robe of righteousness his life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me? He gave his life for mine, for mine. Hey Amen. Thank you for that special. Well, it was good to see you here this morning. And I hope you're having a nice fall day. It definitely is fall outside. Yeah, man. And um, you know what follows fall? I won't say, but uh, you know. Um, it was good to celebrate uh, Ron's 75th birthday yesterday. Uh, Piz and Grilly just turned three quarters of a century, 75 years old. He said that if he knew that he was going to live that long, he would have taken better care of himself. Right, Ron? <laughs> But uh, we appreciate Ron, we appreciate all that he does, and he definitely, uh, he serves up here, he definitely loves his church family, mm -hmm. and uh, thankful for him, and of course, uh, it's good to have, hear Tommy's testimony this morning as well, and uh, like he said, each and every one of us have our own unique problems. Man that is born is born to adversity, yes, and, um, and so, you know, one of the privileges of being a church and a church family is that we're bearing one another's burdens. Yeah and so fulfilling the love of God. Yes, and uh, Tommy couldn't do it without his church family, Amen. and uh, neither can you or I. And, uh, and so we, uh, we appreciate and love one another. Well, we're in Mark chapter number 12. And in Mark chapter number 12, we're going to look at um, the first 17 verses. 
Usually the longer, don't worry, the longer the text, usually the shorter I am, okay? You think, good, I agree. Um, yeah. Jesus is going to talk po politics in this portion of Scripture. So we're going to talk about Jesus and politics, and we're going to let Jesus control the narrative here. Uh, but he is going to mention politics. And um, her little girl asked your father, said, Dad, is it only... Is it only fairy tales that begin with once upon a time? And he looked at her and said, No, honey, most fairy tales begin once I am elected. <laughs> and uh, we are in election season, and I think this portion of Scripture, uh, where Jesus is preaching against sin and proclaiming himself to be Messiah and be God, and uh, we see different religious and political factions trying to politicize Christ's spirituality. And a lot of times you and I get drawn into the same arguments, and I believe what we'll look at here this morning uh, is, is going to help us just as believers to press the reset button and uh, look at Christ's stance on uh, His kingdom and the kingdoms of this world. And we get to see Christ's place here in this fallen world, and uh, we get to follow in Christ's footsteps. So I think this will be beneficial and a blessing to us. Uh, and, of course, we'll read our text, then we'll ask for the Lord's blessing. So if you found your place there, uh, Matthew chapter number 12, we're going to read 17 verses there, then we're going to pray. So if we'll stand at this time for the reading of God's Word. Mark 12, verse number 1. It says there, And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set an hedge about it, and digged a place for the wine fat, and built a tower, and let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And at the season he sent to the husbandmen a servant, that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him, and beat him, and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant, and at him they cast stones, and wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. The inheritance shall be ours. And they took him, and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the husbandmen and give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them. And they left him and went their way. And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is... It lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose is the, this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Amen. And they marveled at him. And uh, let's ask God's help. Let's God, ask God's blessing as we uh, talk about this important subject and we look at the Word of God and see what the Word of God has for us this morning. Um, and so let's ask the Lord for His blessing and for His help. Let us pray. 
Lord, we thank you for just the privilege and the opportunity that we have uh, as believers to gather together here today. Lord, we thank you for your precious and holy, unchangeable word. Uh, and Lord, we thank you for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins on the cross, was buried and rose again the third day, uh, the first day of the week on Sunday. And Lord, we thank you. We get to celebrate this this morning. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, our guide and our teacher, guiding us into all truth. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless this place this morning. May it be just holy, sanctified, set apart. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to truly uh, see your glory through your word. Lord, I pray that you would help us uh, just to see our own reflection, the own, our own day and age in which we live. Lord, help us to know how to behave like Christ here upon this earth. Lord, I pray that you would help anyone here that doesn't know you personally as Savior. Lord, I pray that today might be the day that they receive you uh, as their Lord, as their Savior. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated. In verse number 10, if you look at this verse, the Lord Jesus speaks a parable. Then in verse number 10, he tells us what the parable is about. And in verse number 10, Jesus is constantly referencing the Word of God as he's speaking. If the Lord Jesus Christ came in flesh uh, today and taught you and I, first we fall down on our face and we worship him, and I see he comes up to the pulpit and he was going to instruct you, you know what he'd say? He would say, turn in your Bibles. And he would teach perfectly. I'm very unperfect. The only thing's perfect is what's black and white on your paper, right? But he would teach in perfection the holy word of God. And so what he does here in verse number 10, as he gives this parable of the husbandman, he says, Have ye never read, and he quotes from Psalms, a messianic psalm about the Messiah, about the sent one of God, the holy anointed one, uh, who will take possessions of all the nations of the earth. He says, Have you never read the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is become the head of the corner. Here is one more time in Jesus' life and in Jesus' ministry where he proclaims himself to be God's sent only begotten son. And just previous to this, we're right in the middle of Passion Week, okay, the week that Christ is going to offer himself, willingly lay down his life for the sins of the whole world. The great God-man, the man, Jesus Christ, as a man is going to set his face towards, like a flint towards the cross. He knows what he is here to do. He is going to do his Father's will, and he is going to die in our place, our King, and our Savior is going to die for your sins in my sins. The great show, the great might and strength of Almighty God, I believe, is more demonstrated at the cross than it is at the second coming. Okay? So you have Christ in His great strength and weakness, His wicked men's hands are crucifying. He's saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know, we sing, He could have called 10,000 angels. Well, guess what? If fallen Jack Young, you lay a... A, 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 uh, a nail close to this palm here, okay? I'm, I'm smiting you, okay? And I am taking possession now. Forget about your wicked souls. I'm not dying on the cross. Uh, but Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the perfect God man, is going to lay down himself as Savior on the cross. And so right at the beginning of this week, here's how this week starts, is there's what is called a triumphal entry. Zechariah chapter number 9 that Jesus is going to ride down from the Mount of Olives into the temple. He rides down on a donkey, not an instrument of war, but, a, but a, a, um, a, a beast of burden who is a beast of peace. Kings rode donkeys and mules during times of peace because they're more stable than some big war steed. Mm -hmm. Next time he comes, uh, Revelation oh, yeah, chapter number 14, he's riding on a white what? Don donkey? Horse. He's coming to conquer. And he's going to subdue all the nations of the earth. But the first time the Lord comes, he comes in his humility. He is going to be servant of servants. He's going to be your servant on the cross. The King of Kings is going to serve you by dying for your sins on the cross. Amen. So he's proclaiming himself to be Messiah. Make no mistake that, that Jesus Christ declared himself to be God and God's son. And so the people here in Jerusalem, they're very hyper religious. They're so religious, they don't want Jesus to be any part of it, okay? Yeah. 
They know exactly what he is saying and what he's demonstrating by riding into Jerusalem this way. And he knows exactly, it says they knew that he spoke a parable against them. Them who? The rulers of society during his day and age. Yep. And so what we're going to see here in this chapter, it's like, uh, you know, bomber missions like B-52 is headed towards Christ. It's going to be the Pharisees. It's going to be the Sadducees. It's going to be the Herodians. They're all going to make their attempt at throwing Christ off his track, off his course. Uh, and, but he will not be uh, confounded. He will confound them Amen. and he will, Amen. he will speak the truth against them. And so here's, here's the follow up to Christ's parable against them. I am the cornerstone. And here's what a cornerstone is. And we'll make mention of this in a minute. A cornerstone is the stone by which the whole entire building is set and in a line with. He says that society will be built upon Jesus Christ, the corner stone and the the builders of society are rejecting this cornerstone and they want to build their own society without uh, the Messiah in here in, um, in in verse number 13 I want you to notice here it says and they sent unto him certain of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words and when they were come, they said unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man, and for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it, and he said unto them, Whose is the image in the superscription. And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God's the things that are God's. And it says, And they marveled at him. So um, two different factions, political factions, come to Christ. Uh, one is the Pharisees, and they were started uh, in the intertestament intertestament period uh, during the revolt of Judas Maccabees where they threw off the Greek occupation there in Israel and reestablished temple worship and Pharisees means separated ones and they were going to uh, they were going to uh, be separated from all the Gentile nations around them and Israel was going to be holiness once to the Lord uh, once again and and so they were a separatist nationalist group and uh, let me say this real briefly, a lot of times if you take a hard stand on the Bible, people think you're a Pharisee. The Pharisees had nothing to do with the Bible. And Jesus rebuked them for it. He says that, uh, he said, you make the word of God of none effect through your tradition. It, so they had religious tradition upon tradition upon tradition, and they held the people in a religious spiritual bondage from the top down. And uh, I mean, we see this in human history, have we not? How come there's so many religious wars? Well, mankind knows how powerful religion is. And therefore, man, mankind kicks God out of religion and we're going to take religion over. And this is what the Pharisees did. Uh, but, you know, the longer things continue, the more things stay the same. And don't think for one single minute that you live in a uni unique time period in human history. Let me explain. So the Pharisees, if you were to drive by their house, they've got a yellow flag with, with snake, a snake chopped in pieces on it. And it says, don't tread on me. Okay? And so they are nationalists. They are right wing. They are the religious right. Remember, Jesus ain't, ain't with them, but they're, they're religious right. We always get complained about the religious right. I say, well, just wait till the unreligious right comes. Yep, you man. won't like them at all. So, but they are the religious right. And then you got the Herodians that come. So the Herodians, uh, they follow uh, Herod the Great, and he was the darling of Rome, <laughs> the Edomite, the great builder, uh, and he did all sorts of works during this time period, and he was... Uh, a globalist. Pastor, is there any global? Do you think there's a global conspiracy? Yes, sir. Read Psalms chapter number two. It says, The kings of the earth gather themselves together and say, Let us cast his bands asunder. Yep. He that right sitteth in the heavens shall Amen. laugh. Uh, oh, oh I, got a, I got a verse for Christmas verse. Ready? 
there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. You know what that was at that time? A global government, okay? And, and every single coinage during that time period in which they lived, they had a universal currency. So guess what? If, you know, they destroyed the dollar as planned and we have some sort of universal currency, it won't be the first time. That's right. Okay? That's right. So don't freak out. It, you know, <laughs> as it was in Christ's first coming, so shall it be most likely in the second coming. That's right. Okay? Amen. Amen. And so, but the Herodians, they were, they were the globalists of their day and age. Uh, they were the progressives of their day and age. I mean, Rome had brought in a lot of advances and technology and everything else. Look it up yourself. All roads lead to Rome. And here's the cool thing about the gospel. Uh, the gospel is going to travel down Roman roads. Ha, so the joke's on you, Rome. Okay? And your empire will fall as, as, uh, as Christianity spreads. Okay? So the Herodians and the Pharisees couldn't hate each other more, but the enemy of my enemy is my friends. And so the Christ-like ones, the Christians, have always been the enemy of everybody. Okay? So... We'll see tonight the Sadducees. The Sadducees are another group. They're going to come up and test Jesus. So you have like the Pharisees and the Herodians, the Sadducees. You've got um, some political revolutionaries like um, Judas, who is not uh, Iscariot, but uh, Simon the Zelotus. Uh, and then you have, um, man, my brain's working. Who, who was substituted for Jesus on the cross there? Barabbas, thank you, a political revolutionary. And even the government of Rome would rather have a political revolutionary who actually killed people uh, loose uh, than, to have, uh, than to have Jesus out there on the loose. And so here you have these different segments, and they're coming together in unification against Christianity, and they're trying to force Christ's hand. Where do your loyalties lay? Which side are you going to fall to? And, of course, we know this was a trap uh, because if he says, well, he says you should give taxes to Rome, uh, then they say, well, you, you know, you're just all talk. And the people, you know, he, he's just, you know, he's just going along and he's just blowing smoke. If he said that you're not supposed to give taxes to Rome, then, uh, then they could say this. They could say that... Um, that he is a revolutionary, a revolutionary, immediately go to the authorities and, of course, have him killed, which is their plan. Uh, but Christ is going to lay down his life uh, at the appropriate time and appropriate place. And he, he says this, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, and unto God's the things that are God's. And just before we talk about this verse in light of politics, um, I want you to look at 1 Peter in chapter number 2, 1 Peter chapter number 2. First thing about politics and Jesus is that we have to look at the parable against the nation of Israel. The parable against the nation of Israel. Uh, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is become head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. This is marvelous in our eyes. I'm sorry, I said 2 Peter. 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter number 2. Peter would have been there, he would have heard this parable, and Peter includes this verse, and he applies it to uh, the Jewish people, and he applies it to uh, the New Testament church. And in 1 Peter chapter number 2, and look at verse number 4. 1 Peter 2, 4. First Peter 2, 4 says, To whom coming is unto a living stone disallowed, indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious. Verse number four says, this living stone, it says it was disallowed. So you go back to the beginning of mankind. How long has, been, uh, how long has mankind been rebelling against the rule of man? We have to go back to the Garden of Eden. And Adam, and Adam and Eve failed in the Garden of Eden. They said, we will not build upon this cornerstone, kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Uh, after this, you say, uh, how long was it before man had trouble? Okay, right out of the blocks, remember, Cain slew Abel. Yep. And if you look at that pre-flood era, the antediluvian era, Cain's seed ruled the world at that time. They were the 
Antichrist crowd. You can look at that uh, and study that out, that they controlled all metallurgy, they controlled all music at that time, they controlled all housing, tent making. This line of Cain uh, ruled the fallen world. And then God destroyed the world in a flood. Yes, sir. After the flood uh, was a time of human government. And during human government, uh, there's a guy named Nimrod, and guess what he is? He's a globalist, yes, right? Uh, and so he says, uh, let's build a tower, a tower of Babel. God comes down, confounds the languages, and uh, then in the very next chapter, that's chapter 11 of Genesis, chapter number 12, God finds a man by the name of Abraham. Amen. And he gives a promise to Abraham, by thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and here's what he says, in, in, in essence, in this verse. He said that the Messiah is going to come through your lineage, through your line, and I am going to use your family to minister to the entire world. Amen, amen. And God uh, sends a Savior to that, uh, the, that people by the name of Moses, and Moses is a lawgiver, and Moses gives the people of Israel, Abraham's seed, the law of God, and the nation of Israel was born at the foot of Mount Sinai. You know what it was? We the people. All that the Lord said, we will do. God was their sovereign, and God was to rule them through his law. And they had judges set up at that time. The judges just, uh, they, they exercised and they made judgment according to the law of God. But then remember the nation of Israel. They wanted a king, right? Yeah. Samuel was very disappointed. He was the last judge. And God says to Samuel, they have not rejected you as judge. They've rejected me as their king. And they want to set up an earthly king. And they wanted an earthly kingdom. Instead of following me and me alone, they wanted to be like all the other nations of the earth and have a little S savior, a little political leader yes, that sir. was going to lead them. And then they had a king. And after this, they would stray. A lot of times because of fallen kings would lead the whole nation into apostasy. And God would send prophets to go preach to them. And you can see what the prophets are praying, or, or, uh, praying and preaching uh, as they're ministering to the people. And you know that these prophets, what did they do with them? Did they build up monuments to them and uh, accolades? And no, most of them were stoned. Most of them were persecuted. And then at the last, God said, I will send unto them my son. And when he sent to them his son, what did they do to his son? Let us kill the son that we might inherit the kingdom. And this all, you know, it can be summed up in the um, story of the prodigal son. Yep. You know, the prodigal son wants his inheritance. He, you're, not, you're not supposed to get your inheritance till your old man is dead. So he says to the father, I wish you were dead. Uh, what does mankind say to God? I wish you were dead so that I can take all those things that you give me, give me and do with them what I want to do. Yep. And, you know, the prodigal son goes to the far country and spends his substance on righteous living and begins to be in waste. And it's not until there's a return that the blessings come back. And, and so here in verse number four, uh, 1 Peter chapter number 2, it says, To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, and chosen of God, and precious. He says, But ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, a chief cornerstone, elect precious, he that believeth on him shall not be Amen, confounded. Amen. Uh, unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is become the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereupon also they were appointed." He says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called us out of darkness unto his marvelous light. Here's a few observations from Peter's 
um, preaching or explanation of the cornerstone. Uh, false builders and uh, there's false builders and Christ rejectors in society as a whole. Uh, the kingdoms of this world overwhelmingly have rejected the chief cornerstone. They stumble over him. Uh, another thing is that Christ is a foundation upon which the living stones build their lives. So what happens when you're born again into the family of God? You're taken out of the world's family, you're taken out of Satan's family, and you're placed into God's family. The Holy Spirit of God is put inside of you, and you have a new foundation. He reached way down in that miry pit and set my foot upon a rock and established my goings. And he says, your lively stones built upon that corner foundation. Uh, you think of Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. He ends the Sermon on the Mount with this parable. He says, there's two types of people. He says, there is the wise man who dug down deep and built his foundation upon the rock. And then there's a man that went and on the sifting sands of society, uh, you know, in society... <laughs> I could digress and tell you all the different things in society that were okay, like in the 90s that are not okay now, and the things that were not okay in the 90s that were okay. I mean, society just, the mores of society is constantly shifting, okay? So there's another man, he's not wise, but he doesn't build a foundation. I guarantee you, you can build a lot faster if you don't dig down deep yep. and lay upon a firm foundation. So he just throws up his house right on the sifting sands of society. Uh, but when the waves come and the storms come, and they will, it says that the, the person who built his house upon a rock, his house stood firm in time and in eternity. Okay? And so on the other aspect, those who build their lives upon the sifting sands, it's only a matter of time in this life and in the life to come where the house, remember Junior Church, the house on the sand went smash like that. And there's a day coming where that Christ is going to come and he is going to take inheritance of all the nations of the earth. And not only does he judge individuals and not only does he corporately judge churches, but he also judged the nations at that particular time. And he takes inheritance of the nations and it says, and he giveth it to others. You know, the nation of Israel was given a stewardship of a nation, a people. They were to be holiness unto the Lord. Do you know that uh, it says, we're going to see our identity here in the next verse, that you and I are part of a kingdom, and we have a king, and we are part of a royal family. We're sons and daughters of the king, and we are co-heirs with Christ. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Amen. So there's a day coming on which uh, we will rule and reign with Christ. Mm -hmm. We have a king now here upon this earth, but we are part of a kingdom that is to come. Each and every day when you pray, Jesus said, pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When Jesus was being tried by Pilate, uh, they said, are you a king? And he says, you say this of yourself or does somebody else say this? <laughs> which is so funny. Jesus is trying to win Pilate to the Lord, you know, to, to himself. Use, use everything for an opportunity to witness, right? He tries to make it about Jesus. Jesus turns it right around about him. Hey, don't make it personal. Uh, he says, you know I, not I have the power to kill you? You know what he says? <laughs> you would have no power at all except that we're given to you from my Father which is in Amen. heaven. Amen. And so Jesus said that, yes, I am a king, a king and I have... Uh, servants, but my kingdom is not of this world. So let's look at our true identity in Christ. Look at verse number nine. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. 
And so Christ is our cornerstone. He's the foundation upon which you and I are to build our lives upon. He is the foundation upon which the church is to build upon. He is to be preeminent in his church. And the church we see is to be an outpost of light in a community. So Jesus said, you're supposed to let your little light shine. He says, but a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. As Christians come together and put their lights together, they are a shining city on a hill. And if a church is right with God, it is built upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, our cornerstone. And then also Christ is our fellowship. Look at verse number 10. It says, but which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, and hot obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We are the people of God, declaring praises unto Him. Uh, and and make, make certain that you realize this, that as Jesus said He's the chief cornerstone, He said, what will the husbandman do? Yeah. It says that He will come and destroy those miserable men. So we understand the vengeance is God's. Yes, right, it is buddy. not Amen. ours. And in this world, there is going to be wicked people as there was in Christ's day. And it's not my job and it's not your job to exercise vengeance and judgment. Our job in this day and age, in this time frame before the Lord comes, is to exercise mercy as Christ did when he was in this earth. So we have the parable against the nation of Israel, and then we have the principle about Rome. Rome. Look back in uh, verse number 13 of Mark chapter number 12. So let me talk politics, which you all, you all love, you know. Oh, yeah. How can I get them scared, Lord? How can I get them afraid? How can I? How can I I've been watching Fox News all week. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so I was born in 1978, um, and the first president that I can remember was Ronald Reagan, yeah. the Gipper, you know. I mean, he was a very, I mean, he made you stand up straight and I'm proud to be, you know. I mean, good actor, man. And um, remember during the Cold War, we were all afraid of them Russians. Remember that? I remember seeing on TV, too, we had satellites back in the 1980s in the sky that could shoot laser beams out of them and knock missiles out of the sky. Okay. We had that. I saw it on TV. Some of you saw the moon landing. I, that's what I saw on TV in the nightly news is satellites in the sky. They called it Star Wars and shot laser beams out of the satellites and shot those Russian missiles right out of the sky. And the Russians were like, I give up, right? And the wall came down. And, uh, you know, I, man, then everybody from Ronald Reagan's time forward was compared to Ronald Reagan, right? George Bush. Remember George Bush? You know, he, uh, he was the head of the CIA. His father's name was William Prescott Bush, and uh, they were the deep of the deep state, you know? The good news is about this election, somebody said this, somebody said this in, and um, I thought that is such a good point. Don't worry about who gets elected this fall. The CIA is still in control, okay? And uh, so George W. Bush, Head of the CIA, president, New World Order, not George W., George H. Bush. Yeah. Uh, New World Order, and um, yeah. which to me, I mean, even back then as a teenager, spooked me out because I knew that the Lord was coming again in 1993. Then there was seven years tribulation, and then, you know, then it would be this, you know, the 6,000th year. The Lord will set up his millennial reign, and you didn't really have to worry about too much. You could opt out of Social Security and everything else because the Lord's coming in 1993, right? Um, and then Bill and Hillary Clinton. Oh, wow. Oh, the world was absolutely, positively Coming to an end, I heard it every single Sunday. You know, old Ahab and Jezebel, that dope smoking, draft dodging, hippie, you know, um, running our country into the ground. 
And uh, now, Bill's morality was never too hot, you know. But um, he was the most conservative, fiscally, president of my lifetime by a long, 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 long shot. I know it's your conservative talk. It was Newt Gingrich. Okay, but who had the pen in his hand? Bill Clinton, right? And then after Bill Clinton, we finally got a man on a white horse, Billy Graham himself led George W. to Jesus. I mean, he was born again. I catalyzed the religious right. And um, I personally believe that we lost more freedom under George W. Bush Amen, than any other president since George Washington. But that's just my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay? And, you know, there was wars and, um, you know, freedoms get, you know, given up on the right. And then after George W. Bush, we had the Antichrist for sure. Amen, brother. No, nobody ever accused Joe Biden of being the Antichrist, right? <laughs> One of the things about the Antichrist, we know he's well-spoken. And uh, so guy can't even read a teleprompter. He definitely ain't the Antichrist, right? Uh, and so Obama, I mean, suave and articulate and a beautiful family. I mean, you know, uh, and these agendas. That, oh, I saw Barack fall from heaven. How many ever saw that? <laughs> the, the, the Hebrew word for lightning fall from heaven is Barack. And undoubtedly, God, Jesus told us himself who the Antichrist was. It was Barack Hussein Obama, and that was for sure the Antichrist. And if I had a dollar, I've been in church my whole life, if I had a dollar for every sermon against Bill Clinton and against uh, Obama, I would be a multimillionaire, man. But then, no matter what you think, in 2016, Donald Trump did you a favor, and here's the favor he, he did for you. He showed you that the Bushes and the Clintons and the Obamas were on the same team the whole time. Mm -hmm. So what are you trying to get at? This point is that we live in a fallen world, and we have no Savior but Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. That's right. And that, that uh, we're going to see that Jesus is going to say at the same time, we don't thumb our nose at governmental authority, but instead there is a rendering that is to be done. There's two renderings that is to be done. One is a rendering to government, that we are not rebels against the authority of government. So here's a principle about Rome. Um, Caesar's authority, you can read in your own time. But Romans 13, it says the powers of be are ordained of God. Ordained of God. So I've had an ordination service. Um, that they're men who are in power, they're given their place, they're given their place by God himself. Uh, and so if you rebel against their power, well, don't worry, we'll talk about the clauses to this in a second. But if you rebel against their power, you're actually rebelling against whose power? God's power. OK. Um, and so he says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Let me just read you a few verses. Here's Nebuchadnezzar, a statement um, that, uh, that Daniel makes about him. Daniel 2.20, it says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom or might are his. And he changeth the times and the season. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. Proverbs 8.14, it says, Counsel is mine, sound wisdom. I am understanding, I have strength. By me, kings reign, and, by, and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he goeth. So God sets up authority, and God takes down authority, and it doesn't matter if they won by a fair election or not. They are in authority, and guess who placed them there? God did. God did. And the function of government. Um, Romans 13 lays this out. The punishment of evil. The promotion of good. The protection of the innocent. So those three things. Punishment of evil. They're supposed to be a terror unto evil. They're supposed to uh, promote the good that's in society. And they're supposed to protect the innocent. Protect the innocent. 
uh, soldiers came to John the Baptist and they said, what should we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man. Say, well, well, soldiers aren't supposed to fight. No, when you have an occupying army, like Rome was occupying uh, Israel, do occupying armies typically do good things to citizens or bad? Yeah. Bad, yes. Uh, and he says, do violence to no man. And then he says, neither accuse any falsely, make no false report, false accusation, and be content with your wages. Don't be a revolutionary, be content. And so there's a function of government. So Jesus says here, in the precept of rendering, he says, give unto Caesars the things that are Caesars. So look, if you will, uh, there in Mark chapter number 12, and he says, bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, whose image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesars. And we have these denarius, these pennies from Christ time and you can look you can google image them and see them and you can read them uh and it's caesar augustus and uh the latin words for lord and god you know what they worshiped him as lord and god his image was on all the money mm -hmm. here you have creator god king who doesn't even have a penny to his name he couldn't reach down his pockets so, well look at this penny he says you have a penny no, we don't. And they bring him a penny. Whose image and whose superscription is on this? He says, they say Caesar's. He says, well, give unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give unto God the things that are God. So he says, Caesar's laws, obey them. Caesar's taxes, pay them. Caesar's service, what does Jesus say? If someone asks you to go a mile, go with them twain. This, this is from Roman culture that they were demanded by law. If a soldier asked you to carry uh, his baggage for a mile, you had to give him a mile. He says, go ahead and give that soldier the second mile. He says, give unto your government the things that it deserves and unto God the things that are God's. So what's God's? The coin was made in Caesar's image. And you, are, you and I are made in God's. Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he, him, male and female, created he, them. In Genesis 2.7, it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul did you know that this belief that mankind was made in the image of god is what influenced our nation and also influenced our prosperity i don't ever think for a minute uh, that the united states government uh, was a christian nation in the sense that God ruled by way of a theocracy. Mm -hmm. But even in our founding documents, Thomas Jefferson, uh, who is not a Christian, but who is influenced by Christianity, he never missed a church service. He opened, uh, when he was president, he opened up uh, the, the, uh, he opened up the federal buildings to have church services every single Sunday on Capitol property. Uh, but he, he says this in the Declaration of Independence, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator. creator with certain inalienable rights that our life was given to us by who? You know who you owe your life to? God. His image is on you. Now, let me say, let me say policy-wise, okay? Let's say with the environment, right? Do you know that most of these issues are like somewhere in the middle? Some are going to be, oh, this way a little bit, this way a little bit. But ultimately, um, I remember being in the city of Akron. I was preaching at a church. They were talking about how that the Akron River, uh, they had all these tire factories there, that every single year the Akron River caught on fire. <laughs> the river caught on fire. How many think that's good? Yeah, capitalism. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Dump your. You know, how, how many? You know, how many have been to a dead lake in the Adirondacks? 
You know where that comes from? Chicago. <laughs> How do you like having lakes that a fish cannot survive in? You think that's good? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we could talk about... Um, we could talk about social handouts. We could talk about entitlements. I think all of us are against um, widows and orphans starving to death, right? That's right. <laughs> I think so. And at the same time, you talk to somebody who is very generous with other people's money, which some people are very, very generous people. Not with their own money, with your money, right? Um, you say, do you think that the guy who cooks your fries should get the same as your brain surgeon who operates on your brain? <laughs> say no. So most people are not, you know, equality of outcome. They're really not for that. And so all these confusing policies, where do we stand? I could say one particular thing. Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. There is one dominant issue that all Christians should stand on, plain and sim uh, simple, is that we are pro-life. In this world and also in the next. Amen. You know what the litmus test for me, for every single politician, very easy, is where do you stand on life? And we'll see it in every society. I'm not going to argue this point. I, I can preach a 45-minute sermon uh, on this issue. But all life is the Lord's. That's right. So let's just say that little baby in the womb, guess whose baby that is? And guess who gives that life? And guess who has the ownership of this life? And guess who is the God who will take this life away? Now let's apply this to ourselves, okay? Because it's easy. You can preach political sermons. I, heard I get you all riled up about the people outside this room. We get really angry and mad at them, right? And feel really good about ourselves. <laughs> Whose image are you made in? God. What are you supposed to render to God? Everything. You. He's the chief cornerstone. You're to build your life on his firm foundation and give him your heart and your soul. And yes, you can read the little insert that I put in. It's just verses and principles about your responsibility as a Christian to government. Yes, you should be a, a, a citizen. Yes, you should be involved. Um, you know, back then they had kings, they had sovereigns. But in a, it's not, we don't really have democracy. You know what democracy is? It's two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. Okay? In our constitutional republic, okay, you know who's king? <laughs> you and I. You know what you need to do? Vote. Okay? You need to exercise your citizenship. But I only get one vote. <laughs> All the people in the graveyard only get one vote. Amen? Uh, you know, I, I don't need to be wrapped up in the kingdoms of this world and be all stirred up. What I need to be doing is promoting life in this world and then definitely in the world to come. I need, you know what's going to change people? Is the gospel of Amen. Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. It's going to change them from the inside out. Let's stop there. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for uh, our King, King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us this morning. Just uh, rededicate our lives to you and, and once again say, Lord, your image is upon me. You are my creator. You are my maker. And I render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but I render unto God this morning the things that are God's. And I put myself on your altar, on your throne. I surrender to you, King of Kings. And, and Lord, I pray that you would help us this morning uh, just to understand this concept that you taught so long ago. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, and uh, we'll have a hymn of invitation. However God spoke to your heart, uh, let's speak to Him. Much for tuning in to the services of the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church. 
we wanted to tell you about our new app that you can go to the App Store right now and find the Lighthouse Bible Baptist Church app. And there on our app, you'll find all of our services there. You'll find all of our music specials. Also, we have podcasts. We have blog posts there. And uh, you can look up our coming events. You can sign up for events there. And it's a beautiful new application. We're very excited to tell you about it. And please go right now and download that app. God bless you. And we'll see you next time.